Um, my name is Larry Bowen. I'm going I'm to get started now since there's about 50 people in the room, 51 with that guy. Uh, since the last presentation ran a little long, I was just giving people a little more time to get here, but uh, screw them. I'm going to get started with this pre presentation. It's called uh, Igniting Viral Campaigns. My name is Larry Balin. I am the CEO of an internet marketing company called Single Throw. Uh, Single Throw. And I'm the author of a best-selling internet marketing book called Mommy, Where Do Customers Come From? Uh, and I think the reason they asked me to do this presentation was that this book was a, a fairly big viral success when it came out in November of 07. Within about three or four hours, uh, it rose to three or four bestseller lists. Uh, but it took a lot of preparation to make those type of things happen. And this is actually a new version that just came out in August, which I'll talk about in a second. But I want to get into this, get things going, um, get you guys kind of ignited, and go from there. You can see by the amount of people that are at this show how, comp <clears throat> how competitive the landscape is out there. When it comes to the internet and the economy is just in the tank, things are very, very competitive. Everyone is just looking and scrambling for anything they can get their hands on and trying to examine every avenue to make things happen. So uh, don't tell Sean, but I changed the name of this presentation from igniting viral campaigns to clicking ass. <laughs> because it's my opinion that that's what everyone needs to learn to do when it comes to the internet. And I know I've spoken at Affiliate Summit a few other times, and uh, I know there's a wide variety of people from novices to experts and anywhere in between that are at the show that are in this room. So I'm going to try to address as, as many as I can and as many different things. This is also the name of my uh, second book, which will be out next year. So you can all keep a lookout for that. These are some of my clients. Uh, I show you this because one of the big mistakes people make in marketing is focusing too much on their own industry. We're a marketing company. We're an internet marketing company. We're very fortunate to have some of the best of the best as clients. Uh, big brands that everyone's heard of, from Acer to Sara Lee and Endust and Purolate or so on and so forth. But the reason that they hire us is because we don't focus on one specific industry. We look and see what other people are doing. We never really look at our clients' competitors. We don't want to level the playing field. We want to beat them. We want to see what we can bring new ideas to the table. So to get, to get something viral, whether it's an idea, whether it's a video, whether it's a, a marketing message, you have to look beyond the walls of your industry. That's where success lies. So like I said, I have some good news. The good news is the second edition of this book just came out. And it's available in bookstores now, uh, as well as online, which is where most people buy things and buy this book anyway. Um, but I have better news. I decided for the entire month of August, uh, the last time the book came out, we donated all the proceeds to charity and raised thousands of dollars. So we decided to do the same thing again. So for any purchase of the book, 100% of all the proceeds for the entire month of August are going to local charity in the area. So if you can help out, that would be appreciated. And that's about all I'm going to say about the book. So the first step in igniting any viral campaign and lots of things can be a viral campaign. So the very first step is pre-ignition, is to try to figure out what you're doing, try to figure out who you're targeting, creating a plan. Very few people, most of the time viral fails because no one thinks about the person watching the video, reading the website, looking at the blog. No one thinks about the person on the other side. You have to step out of yourself and look from the outside in. And understanding your customers, and everything I'm going to tell you and everything that I write about is actually sales and marketing 101. It's just for some reason no one applies it when it comes to the web. So hopefully this will help you re-energize some of that. The first thing I look at whenever we do anything for anyone is who their customers are. Who is this meant for? What do we want to have happen? And un the more you understand about a customer, and I'm going to call them customers, even if they're just people that are watching or eyeballs or whatever you want to call them, they're customers. You're trying to, to enact some sort of success, a sale. The easiest thing to identify with customers is their average age, how tech savvy they are. That helps you identify what you should put in front of them. Different generations. You have the silent generation 
1925 through 1942. I would imagine we're, they're silent for a reason and they're not online reading your blog. So look at baby boomers. Baby boomers are a third of all internet users. They are internet savvy, not tech savvy. In a lot of cases, they're using older technologies to access the web because it's where their comfort level is. Generation Jones is our president's generation. Now, this is a, the first seated president that, that is using a BlackBerry. Uh, this is a presidential election that was primarily won on the internet. So now you're getting into a more tech-savvy, internet-savvy generation. And you have to speak to each one of these generations differently. Different things entice different people, depending on their lifestyles. Generation X, which is my generation, we have both tech and internet savviness. Uh, we don't know of a world without computers, but the generation behind us, Generation Y, which is what every business is scrambling for, doesn't know of a world without the internet. So they think differently. They don't think the way that we think. Um, and I know there's probably some Generation Y, so I say we just play along. Um, I've used the Yellow Pages. Generation Y has never used the Yellow Pages. They don't think categorically. So you have to know who you're in front of, what the message is, what will connect, and what doesn't connect. That's the first step in anything you do in marketing, and viral will flop if you don't know your audience, and you don't do that pre-ignition planning. It's critical. You wouldn't build a birdhouse without a blueprint. So viral, when I was asked to do this presentation, um, I needed to know more about the word viral. Obviously, I, I know what the word is, um, and I know how people use it. But I really wanted to drill down into the word viral, so I looked it up in the dictionary, and it said, of the nature or caused by a virus. C virus. Okay, there's only a couple pages more. Um, virus. There are six, actually seven definitions of the word virus. The first is a corrupting influence on morals or the intellect. Her song is called Give Me More for a Reason because all you people want is more, 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 more! Leave her alone! You're lucky she even performed for you bastards! Leave Brittany alone! That's the Leave Brittany Alone guy, I think. Um, very popular, ended up on late night TV, um, put out this video, very passionate, passionate plea for the media to leave poor Britney alone, and uh, it was wildly popular. You know, it was viral. It was a, and it, it actually fits into that virus definition nicely. Uh, another one, a, self, a segment of self-replicating code planted illegally on a computer or program, often to damage or shut down a system or network. I came up with a concept for this, for this Tron guy costume by going to a science fiction convention that also was a crossover to a computer convention. I'm going to stop that one there because it's about all I can take of it. It's Tron guy. He's been on Jimmy Kimmel Live. He is dead serious about that costume and why he created it. And it was viral and is a virus and fits that definition well. Something that poisons one's soul or mind. All right, some of you that were laughing know that's the Numa Numa guy. Again, he's got a slew of websites out there. He was, his mouth is very disturbing to me whenever I look at it. It's like an upside down smile. And, uh, Fits that virus definition very well and was viral. <clears throat> Foul or malodorous fluids, sticky substance agent that causes infectious disease. Zoom the camera out and see the light chocolate grain. Or has to be boiling yesterday, chocolate grain. I first saw the chocolate rain guy on Jimmy Kimmel, and he was also on Conan. Again, he was deadly serious about that song and singing it in the studio, and it became viral and fits that definition very well. Uh, Chocolate Rain actually sounds like something you can catch. Uh, extremely simple microorganisms.
That's Afro Ninja, afroninja.com. And very funny, that's the, I didn't make this stuff up. This is out there. Again, fits the definition of virus nicely. And um, my favorite is any of various extremely small, often disease-carrying agents. That's Dramatic Chipmunk, who's my favorite. Um, obviously, someone's chipmunk, pet chipmunk, or in a, I believe this backstory is it was in a pet store, and they had a camera on, and it just made that dramatic turn. They put music behind it, and people started replicating this. They started creating this video for themselves and putting their own twist on it. This is my favorite, um, I guess, fan video of Dramatic Chipmunk. And we hold the world ransom for... One million dollars. <laughs> All right, you get it. Uh, millions and millions of people. Actually, it um, counts in the billions. Just these few videos have had billions and billions of views. Crazy. But these videos were viral by accident. The question is, were they successful because they had billions and billions of views? The answer is no. They didn't set out to make money, to make profit. These YouTube celebrities weren't even thinking about a profit. They were just being themselves, and apparently that's funny to the rest of the normal world, and they didn't make any money. They're, they struggle now to kind of hold on to any kind of YouTube celebrity they may have as the next big phenom comes along. They're selling t-shirts and things like that, but they're not getting invited to the talk shows, and no money was made. No success happened whatsoever. Volume of people looking at your videos, looking at your blog, does not equal success. Now, if you really think about it, as a strategy, could these YouTube celeb videos have been ignited for profit? Can you take any one of those and figure out a way to use it for profit, like maybe a big brand, like Chocolate Rain? What can you do with Chocolate Rain? Well, I think Hershey should sponsor Chocolate Rain. It'd be a great song for Raisinets. I can see it in the commercials. It, Tron Guy is a no-brainer. It's Radio Shack. <laughs> no-brainer right there. And Dramatic Chipmunk is an absolute no-brainer. But, I mean, you know, what would you do for, like, an Afro Ninja or some of the other ones out there, Sneezing Panda? If they thought about these pieces after they created their videos, these things may have been able to make money. And if these big brands thought about the viral and the social culture a little more, they'd be using these YouTube celebs to turn it into something and create it. Now, not everybody's bad at this, or they don't have one side or the other. There is a company that does ignite viral campaigns very well. If you're going to ignite a viral campaign, you need to learn to influence. And I use the word influence because no one likes the word sell. But you need to learn to sell. That's, nothing happens unless a sale takes place. Sales is not a dirty word. It's influence. It's knowing how to influence somebody. It's thinking about what's in front of them before it gets put in front of them and what the reaction is going to be. That's what ignites a viral campaign. The greatest book ever written on viral social and affiliate success. I'm going to tell you what the title of that. It's one book that is the absolute best book on all of the subjects that are discussed at this show that I'm discussing. If you want the best book on Twitter, this is the best book about how to succeed in Twitter. Um, and I'm sure you'll be very surprised to know it was written 70 years ago. It's How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. First came out in 1936 or 1937 is when it was first published. And it is amazing. It teaches you to think before you speak, to think about how your words are going to influence someone, what kind of reaction is going to come out of whatever you put in front of someone. Whenever, whenever I speak, and I fly all over the country speaking, I'm always asked, what's the best book for Twitter? What's the best book for Facebook? What's the best for viral video? This one. And it was written 70 years ago. I've read it seven times. I recommend you do the same. It's about nine bucks on Amazon. E-Trade has done a really good job at cre creating viral and profit. The E-Trade baby 
who was in Super Bowl commercials, uh, and they have multi has become like a, a phenom out there. Doesn't have as many eyeballs on it as Chocolate Rain or Leave Britney Alone, but they're making more money than those guys. And, and there's a reason. I'm going to share a couple of the videos. If you're not familiar with the E-Trade Baby videos, I have two that are my favorites. The latest one that just came out, you can kind of tell who they're targeting as a customer. Uh, this is weak, man. Frank's trying to not pay me my winnings for the skins beatdown I just issued him because his 401k is tanking. It's like, dude, you got to grab the reins, man. Get E-Trade, do some analytics, do some research, and take charge so I don't have to subsidize your lack of golfing skills. Then the night told... You moved your ball. Frank, it was on the cart path. Why don't you try reading the rules, Shankopotamus? Take control with one of the most powerful investing machines there is. Join the thousand new accounts a day at each. That's an awesome video. And you can tell who they're targeting. And it works very well. You can tell just by who laughed. This was, I believe, the first one they ever created. And it was a runaway success. A lot of people are like, aren't you too young to invest in the markets? And, you know, A, don't worry about it. You know, I just look young. I mean, you don't know how old I am. B, I use E-Trade, so check it. Click. I just bought stock. You just saw me buy stock. No big deal. I mean, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. Oh. 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 Whoa. It's so easy. There are a thousand new... Those are great. Those are freaking great. Why are they great? Why do they make E-Trade money? They connect. They connect with everybody. It's just, this, this clicks ass because it evokes emotion. If you won't sell anything unless you evoke emotion. Everything you create will be successless unless you evoke emotion. It's humor, desire, belonging, trust, anticipation, excitement, fear. These videos have it all. They've evoked all of that stuff. I mean, there's no doubt that it's easy to use. A baby can use it. I mean, so that's in there. Kind of what Geico does with the cavemen, that kind of thing. It's very simple. Desire. I want to do it. It's funny as can be. You know, anticipation. Am I losing out? There's the, there's the fear if I don't do it. If you want to ignite your viral campaign, you have to evoke some sort of emotion that creates some sort of anticipation, some sort of desire. Humor is the best way to do it. But if you don't create the desire and the anticipation, nothing happens. Sales is about persuasion. Persuasion requires emotion. Emotion requires connection. Connection leads to action. That's when things start to happen. That's when the rubber meets the road when you can make these things happen. You have to connect better. And if we look at companies that are connecting better, look at the character connection. If you want to create something that connects better with your customers, most of, the, most of us have been connected and continually are connected with characters. It seems to connect better than anything else, like the E-Trade baby. Every major brand uses characters for connection. From the Mac and PC guy, the uh, freecreditreport.com guy, Verizon, William Shatner is the negotiator for Priceline. People remember these characters. You can market with a character. People relate to certain things. And you find a character that matches the lifestyle of the people that you're trying to connect with, create a character. You also want something that's memorable, especially if you don't have the budget that these companies have. But this is nothing new. This has been going on since all of us were kids. Green Giant, Mr. Whipple, Tony the Tiger, Pillsbury Doughboy, the High Sea Guy, Joe Azuzu. Does anybody remember Joe Azuzu? Yeah, a few people, right? That guy made you laugh. The Dunkin' Donuts guy. Time to make the donuts is historic when it comes to marketing. The Budweiser Frogs, the Lizards, the Noid for Dominoes, the Taco Bell Chihuahua, who, the Taco Bell Chihuahua actually just died recently, so sorry to tell you. 15 years old. It's serious. He died. Sorry. No care of Chihuahua. Um, this is not new. And the reason it stands the test of time is because it works. A lot of companies are creating characters around what they do, around who their, their customer will connect with. And it's a good way. It, maybe it won't work for what you're doing. Maybe it will. But it definitely makes a connection if you do it right. 
We used a character for one of our clients. Um, one of our clients is a health and fitness supplement company. You know, they sell, you know, probably this stuff and 3,000 other products. This gentleman is Ronnie Coleman. He's the eight-time winner of the Mr. Olympia competition. He's won eight times in a row. Uh, there's only one other gentleman by the name of Lee Haney who's, ever, who's won eight times in a row. Uh, even Arnold Schwarzenegger won, only won seven and only six consecutively. And I say only like it's, any of us can do it, but only. So he's, Ronnie's considered the best there's ever been. Ronnie went to go a few years back and win the record-breaking number nine that no one's ever won, and he lost. One week later, he's in my office. Uh, not because we're buddies or anything. I never even heard of Ronnie Coleman because I don't follow bodybuilding. But a client of ours produces a product that Ronnie endorses. So we came up with the idea, let's use Ronnie as a character to, since everyone wants information now about what happened, let's use him as the character and the spokesperson for the product instead of him just having his name on it. So what we did worked very well, and it led to the story of Ronnie Coleman in a candy bar. It's actually a protein bar, and I know you guys just had lunch, so I'll take care of that. Um, some people ask me to remove it sometimes, because it might be more disturbing there than, I don't know, I like it here. Uh, that's a protein bar, and that's the one that Ronnie endorses. So we have this celebrity bodybuilding superstar, bodybuilding royalty in our office, and have to figure out what to do with him. And the first thing we do, if we're going to ignite any kind of viral campaign around this product, we have to figure out who eats this product, who uses this product, who do we need to be in front of, and who don't we need to be in front of. Well, this, this particular product has 30 grams of protein. Uh, for the average person, it's really tough to withstand 30 grams of protein in one sitting. Uh, well, you'll be sitting. It just will probably be in the bathroom most of the day. Protein does a, does a number on your stomach, and if you're not used to it, it'll, it'll wipe you out. So who does eat 30 grams of protein on a regular? It's fitness enthusiasts, amateur bodybuilders, trainers, so on and so forth. Any, any athletes, those types of people that, that are on a regimen would do that. So that's who we want to be in front of. So we created what ended up being a 20 or 30 minute interview, video interview with Ronnie, that we did a video podcast. And we only spoke about this protein bar for about 30 seconds. Uh, people want to know what he eats, what he drinks, when he sleeps, uh, when he works out, how often, what he lifts, all those types of things so they can mimic him because he's the best. So we talked about things that no one knew about Ronnie before, where he went to school, how he got into bodybuilding. Um, well, you know, he's got a degree in accounting. No one knew he had a degree in accounting. Who would have thought? Um, that's definitely an accountant you're going to listen to. Uh, you know, he wants to be a police officer because he can pull cars over by hand. So th these are things that most people didn't know about Ronnie. Bodybuilder Magazine called the best interview we'd ever done. Now, this, what happened was this product, this sleepy little product in the back of a catalog, ignited. It's now in 7-Elevens. It's in supermarkets. It's everywhere. Any magazine now devoted to bodybuilding has full-page ads for this product. It went through the roof and became their number one selling product because we thought about who to put this in front of. Every day, more people watch it like it's brand new. And he's going to be making a, supposedly making a comeback, I believe, uh, next year, and that'll reignite it. And we won't have to do anything because people will start searching for him again. If you type in Ronnie Coleman interview into YouTube, it's, it's number one, um, you know, Hundreds of thousands of people have watched this. People comment on it all the time. I get comments all the time. They break out in discussions about steroids, about what he eats, about all kinds of things. But it continues the conversation. And it continues forever because it's fairly timeless. If you go to Google and type in Ronnie Coleman interview, you're going to find this video. You know, for it to be viral, we had other legs, not just YouTube. We made sure it showed up in organic. Uh, we initially did a pay-per-click campaign. We got people to watch this thing. And then it just took off on its own. Now, I'm always asked at the end of my presentation, so I'll bring it up first, why Ronnie Coleman interview, not Ronnie Coleman video? Wouldn't more people type in Ronnie Coleman video than Ronnie Coleman interview? And that is true. More people do type in video than interview. But if you think like a customer, and you think from the other side, what are you looking for when you're looking for an interview? You're looking for information. So you're more qualified. I want people that want 
detailed information about Ronnie, not a wacky video he created. If you, if you type in video, you're looking for entertainment. And there are thousands of really quick Ronnie Coleman videos out there that are very entertaining, similar to and including this one. That's 900 pounds. Uh, I think the only two people on the planet that can lift 900 pounds, and he did it twice, is Ronnie Coleman, and uh, I believe it's you, sir, right? Yeah, it's that guy with the yellow shirt. So those are the only two. Very impressive. Again, it's about connecting better. Everything I'm talking about is about connecting better, and understanding who you're connecting with helps you connect better. So what about the community connection? Well, we did a... a I guess you can call it a viral video campaign for Acer computers, for their new, well, not new anymore, um, their new netbook called the Aspire One. They actually came to us with their ad agency and said, hey, we've got this video asset. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. And they, it turned out video asset to an agency means commercial. I said, well, why don't you just say commercial? So they had this commercial and they wanted it to be a viral video. And you know, I want to be a lot of things too that's never, never going to happen. So we told them, no, that's just not going to happen. People aren't going online to watch commercials. You know, we're trying to avoid commercials like the plague. We don't believe them anyway. Um, so if you want to spread this, you have to think differently. And we're going to have to connect with the audience differently and not, and not throw a commercial up on YouTube. And the commercial sucked. It was horrible. Um, it was like two hookers using a laptop. I didn't get it, but anyway. Uh, so what we, the idea that we had was, I mean, listen, netbooks are very cool. I carry one. They're, they're great to use. They're, there's a lot of benefits to it. This one in particular, the benefits are it boots up in like 10 seconds. It's got a webcam in it. It's wireless. You know, it, it's, it's, the thing is, it's lightweight. It's got everything you would want in a, in a little netbook. So why don't we take those benefits, because benefits are what sell, and we get other people to create videos, and we create a contest around it. Let them create the videos. Let the people that are good at creating these online videos do it with a purpose. So we can create what I was talking about earlier, like Chocolate Rain and Hershey's. And we did. We, we put this out here, and it was, it was pretty amazing. There was a big contest. Um, we got it to spread, and those videos will out, actually outlast the product. We went to the organic listings, created a whole website around this product and the video contest itself. Highly optimized for organic. Even today, even though the contest was over in January, if you type in uh, video contest, video contest, movie contest, movie contest, any type of contest related to video, we're on page, that, that page is on page one. So people are still going there, still watching it. That's how we attracted the movie makers. And people were, people looking for contests they're looking for them because they want to enter the contests. So that's how we attracted them before we get started. I'm going to just show you the video that won.
I think that video portrayed that product pretty well and got the point across and kept you kind of entertained. You looked at it and you're, you're like, wow, that's kind of cool. Um, we didn't use creative as a judging uh, uh, criteria. It was based on how many people watched it, how many comments they got on YouTube, how many honors they won. So we didn't want you just to create a video. We wanted you to spread it. So you had to use your networks, leverage everything you had to get people to watch it. This one won like seven YouTube honors, most discussed, most watched, so on and so forth, because this gentleman leverages networks. The reason, the, the, actually, the reason it spread so well is because he created two videos, the making of as well as the video. And the cool thing about the making of video was you found out that most of the original video was done on a green screen in his driveway. <laughs> Pretty cool. And there was a whole time lapse making of. And he, obviously the landing, he didn't land, jump off the roof with his hang glider and land in front of the green screen. He's, a, he's an avid hang glider, but he, he did a whole video on how he made it. And people liked it, and they started discussing it, and they started leveraging networks and spreading it. And he won. And the coolest thing about him winning was not the prizes and cash and laptop that he won. It was that Acer contacted them to work on their next commercial so they don't have any more prostitutes in there. <laughs> We leverage the contest to get people to come to the contest by using social networks, Facebook, MySpace, and we created a YouTube channel. Uh, and that worked very well. People were watching and commenting on these videos on a very regular basis. So we got people to these channels, then let them go and comment on the videos that were created. There were two other, there were more than two, but these are the two big players that were creating and running video contests at the exact same time we were, Crazy Glue and Nature Valley Granola. I actually sat through a Google uh, webinar about this Nature Valley uh, campaign with their ad agency. It was run by their agency. Crazy Glue um, spent what's reported at close to, if not a little over, a million dollars on their campaign and got 10 entries. You wouldn't think it was real hard to go out and buy a $3 tube of Crazy Glue and create a video. Um, apparently it is. Uh, although 10 entries is actually respectable. To get somebody to go out and do something for free for the chance at winning something, maybe is kind of tough. I mean, listen, you probably couldn't pay me 20, 30 bucks to go get your glass of water. So you're gonna waste days of my time to go to do this to maybe win? It's tough. It's really hard to get people to, to get motivated. Um, Nature Valley actually had 14. So they were the kind of high scorer there. Uh, their agency alluded to they were close to a $4 million budget. Yeah, wow. and view it, which I, I think is just like insane. It was all advertising that was done. There were no community connections. There was nothing viral about it. It was a lot of buying space. Uh, I know they bought the home page of YouTube for a while, and I know that's close to 250 grand for what they were doing there. Um, they were just spending money, but it didn't seem to work all that well. Um, anyway. What we did is, is what I showed you. We leveraged organic search, we leveraged the networks, and we let the video creators spread it. We had hundreds of thousands of views on the videos. They, people are still viewing them ongoing. We had 20 YouTube honors, 40 plus entries, and it cost less than 100 grand. So viral and successful and profitable. If you think through it and you have a plan. Leveraging your networks is, is critical. Everyone, this show is, is about the people that are here. Everyone here is highly connected. Yes? What was the major part of the spend? Uh, the major part, probably development of the engine that we tabulated everything with. So more development, SEO. So it's a lot of optimization. Um, we did a little paid search to attract more of the producers, movie producers than anything else. Mm -hmm. But organic seemed to attract more than anything did. How many entries did you have? We had over 40 entries. Um, some of them were amazing and, and funny and could, are very viral. Some of them were horrific and terrible. Um, but you know, you get a little bit of both. They've, you get 40 people that are spending intimate time with a product to learn about it because we wanted the benefits of the product in the videos. And they're get, trying to get it to spread. So even if it was a terrible video, if they followed the, and the guidelines and got enough people to watch it and comment and discuss it, they still could have won. So these people would have had to own the product already? 
No, that was actually the interesting part. The hang glider, I think, was the only guy that owned the product. Um, the other, maybe there was one other. There were most of the, what we did is we put materials up on the site. Videos that you could use, still pictures, so on and so forth. And if you happen to have the product, great. Uh, but it led you to be a little more creative about what you do with it. So it was kind of cool. Um, leveraging networks is, is critical. Everyone here is highly connected through Twitter. I mean, thousands and thousands of friends. There's some people uh, that you'll meet at this show that are just crazy influencers. So leveraging networks, getting some benefit out of it other than just having a bunch of friends and followers is important. You're, you're, lever you're creating it for a reason, not just to do it. So I want to get some benefit out of it. I mean, these are the two major networks, and, and let's be honest, unless you're a band, you know, or a musician, uh, or 14. <laughs> so it's really Facebook is the, is the major mainstream player. You know, there, there's early adopters that have moved on to other stuff already. But as far as the mainstream, if you're looking to be in front of mainstream America, it, it's Facebook. You know, Facebook is the player. Uh, and for good reason. I mean, their demographic swings higher than most at 35 and up. Um, people spend like three billion minutes a day on Facebook. It's just one in five people that access the internet are on Facebook. It's, it's kind of crazy astounding numbers and I, and I think you'll see a lot more to come with Facebook. But you have to learn to leverage these networks. And you can't do it poorly because there's a big backlash. If you're trying to create something viral, and most of you know this, this is more for the people that are kind of in the beginning stages of this stuff, um, you have to contribute. You can't just go out there and put ads. We've been working lately with a lot of large auto groups. So lots of different car dealers, auto groups that own 30 and 40 car dealerships across the country, BMW, Mercedes, so on and so forth. These guys are horrific at this stuff. I mean, and you wouldn't expect anything less. Um, they're very salesy. They're very in your face. They're very disruptive. That kind of stuff doesn't work. If you build a great network, don't F it up. Contribute. They just throw their newspaper ads up there. Again, I, people don't read the newspaper for a reason. Not because it's not on Facebook. You know, I, I'm not to disparage any company, especially a big one, but the New York Times booth out there is probably the quiet. You can, if you want to go read something in a quiet space, sit at the New York Times booth out on the expo floor. It's quiet over there. So you want to contribute. You want to get good ideas. Even if you're trying to influence someone to do something, you still need to do it in a way that evokes emotion and you're contributing. Get them to want to do what's going to entice them to move forward, to connect with your network and spread the word. You have to think about things. A lot of people just contribute with no end in sight, no, no, um, no success in their head, no idea where it's going to end, constant contributing and they're hoping, hoping that it turns into something and hope is just not a strategy. You need to have a plan. First you. Are you familiar with Chevy's 230 campaign? Is that viral? Do you talk about a lot of them? Get them to comment and wonder what it is? Um, I, I don't know if it's viral or... I guess time will tell if it's, if it's viral. Um, I don't know if that was too viral. I mean, Chevy and the, the major manufacturers do a great job at viral. They have a product um, and they use typically what they use in tra even making traditional advertising viral, they use songs that we know. I mean, Like a Rock is a song that every time I hear it, I think of the Chevy truck. You know, and that's done all over the place. Pepsi, Coke, um, Chevy, every company that's using traditional marketing tries to make it viral and ignite it by making it memorable and evoke an emotion. Music evokes emotion in a lot of people. So they start using that kind of stuff and well-known music, like no one writes jingles anymore. Jingle writers are out of work. Everyone's buying music that people know. So that's how they do it. That campaign, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't really have a good answer for you on that. BMW did, uh, did an ad campaign a while back where they actually, they actually produced a bunch of videos. Do you know what happened if that was successful? It was not. BMW has done a bunch of stuff. I think that was the same agency that got them banned from Google. Uh, BMW got banned from Google, the organic listings, because they were cloaking and hiding key phrases and all that other stuff and redirecting because their agency did it. And if you type that into Google, BMW banned from Google, you'll find it on CNN and everywhere else. And they, so uh, that one I don't believe was successful at all. Those videos are still out there. I see them. We have about four or five BMW dealerships as clients, all the same auto group. 
and uh, there's a lot of crappy stuff out there that never went anywhere. I'm sorry. I just don't think they leveraged the networks properly. I don't think they understood the culture. I don't think they, it, that was it. I mean, it was the video. It was treated like a, com, kind of like a commercial, or it was marketed like a commercial. Um, a lot of those things also started on television, where to learn more, and then you would go and watch the video. They were done very, very well, but sometimes the amateur stuff spreads faster, you know, in, in the way that it's done. It's you. Uh, speaking of the car uh, campaigns, I think about a year ago, another car manufacturer did a, a video contest, and they got a lot of negative entries about the brand. What's, uh, what's your experience with that? Of negative entries? Yeah. Uh, negative's tough. I mean, listen, the car, and that may be something with car dealers, obviously. Um, the car industry, uh, car dealers specifically, are the number one most complained about business to the Better Business Bureau. Number one. There isn't even a close second. That's how high it is. The, the number two are cell phone companies. Uh, but it's not, they're not even close to car dealers. So. You do run that risk. When you, when you have a major brand that people connect with or don't connect with, had a problem with, didn't have a problem with, uh, Chevy as a brand relies on their reputation on many different levels, all the way down to the dealership, the service managers that are working on the cars, even the local mechanic is, hey, this thing's a piece of crap. I don't even know why you bought it. That gives you the, the brand a negative connotation. So it's very tough to manage reputation when it comes to a brand of that size. When you're not a brand of that size, it is a little easier. It's about connecting with and righting the wrongs or addressing them seems to help a lot. But with big brands, you really need a bunch of people to create a strategy because it can have a backlash. Yes? Uh, you were talking about examples to become viral using entertaining, your humor, your humor. But do you have any uh, examples like how can you educate and you can Viral the same way. Well, you see a lot of that actually in Facebook. There's a lot of causes that become viral, and there's uh, you know webinars and education, and a lot of companies do it. Affiliate Summit's actually pretty great at it, uh, with what they put out there and, and how much education they link to. You know that's that that one's actually kind of easy because you're giving something from an education perspective. People want knowledge. They don't. They're not traveling to a lot of these shows, so education is is a, it's kind of a gimme. It's, I'll give you this if you give me this, and it works very well. I would look at what Affiliate Summit does, because they're, they're pretty much masters at it. Um, no one's better than they are. Well, maybe, maybe this guy. And the guy that can lift my your pants. So here's the, the, that all really comes down to social media with no strategy drives traffic. Strategic thought and value creates revenue. I'm a born and raised Jersey guy. I come in and out of the city all the time. Traffic has never, ever meant anything good to me, ever, <laughs> ever. It's the same thing with the web. It's slowdowns, it's interruptions. How much time are you gonna spend with, with, with bad leads? You know, I can't really handle many more people that are emailing me out of the blue that wanna get me to the top of Google. So it, it's, I'd rather only show up in front of the people that matter. I wanna connect with the right people. I put a lot of thought into doing that. One of the questions in the last seminar, I just happened to be in the back, was someone that was talking to, I believe it was a Google representative, about their AdWords campaign. And they said, well, we have like a thousand keywords or, or something like that. And you know, is that good to have even if no one clicks on it? To me, the answer is no. I mean, cut, start cutting. Figure out what makes you money, not gets you traffic. And take the, the budget and focus it. Everything is about focus. There's so much noise out there. You have to focus to ignite any kind of campaign, viral or not. Viral is, is, is kind of meaningless. Everything you're doing, you're, you're wanting your pay-per-click campaign to be viral because you just want it to spread, but you want it to spread to the right people. And thinking like a customer, it's got to be three quarters of this book is about thinking like a customer, changing the way you think to connect better. The 2009 Honda Accord sedan redefines the passenger vehicle segment, offering crisply executed sheet metal, generous interior space, and clean yet fully capable powertrains. She had me a clean powertrain. Yeah. Who the hell talks like that? Crisply executed sheet metal. Is that like your number one thing when you're going to buy a Honda? Does this car, this car have clean sheet metal? Crisply executed? Clean powertrains? 
That is a video created by Honda to go to us, car buyers. That's supposed to entice us. Sheet metal sounds cheap, it sounds thin. It's not, they don't speak the same language. They don't think like a customer. They talk over our head. They talk about jargon. You know, I've never even heard the term crisp sheet metal, crisply executed sheet metal. That's like ridiculous. So what we did with one of our Mercedes dealerships is because the Mercedes has a bunch just like that. We said, we're not gonna do that. We have to make this real. We have to connect to the people that want this particular model vehicle. So I, I personally went into this dealership uh, it's one of the top luxury car uh, auto groups in the, on the Northeast. And I said, I need a bunch of salespeople. And I had a camera with me. So I gathered them over. I said, go stand next to your favorite vehicle on the showroom floor, which is not hard to do when you're in a Mercedes dealership. Or maybe it is because there's more than one. Uh, each salesperson went and stood next to it. And I walked up and I said, okay, I'm going to put you on camera now, and you're going to tell me why that vehicle is your favorite vehicle. And I said, don't tell me about the sheet metal. I don't want to know how big the tires are. Don't tell me the wheelbase. Don't tell me anything I can read in a brochure. Tell me why you love that car. Simple. One guy did a great job with the Mercedes SUV. He says, oh, this year the mirrors are much bigger. We got this vehicle from my wife. She says she loves that because there's no blind spot. Wow, I didn't read that in a brochure. That connects. That's real. This is one we created. This is one of my favorites, actually. Hi, my name is Derek Fox, Ray Katina Mercedes-Benz, Edison, New Jersey. I present to you, for your driving pleasure, the 2009 Mercedes-Benz CLK 350 convertible. It is everything you've ever heard about it and then some. Right now, she's showing off as a pillarless coupe. But what I like about it, in addition to the powerful V6 engine, 268 horsepower, um, is how it converts from a pillowless coupe to a convertible. Watch this. I'm using the infrared key fob and pointing it at the door handle without touching the car. And voila, the transformation process begins. In less than 23 seconds, the car goes from a coupe to a drop-dead gorgeous easy to look at, convertible. Your neighbors, your friends are going to be so through with you. But who cares? Life is too short and the road too long to drive anything less than a Mercedes Benz. That was one take. It was real. There was no script. He just kind of rolled with it. He likes the car. People call up that want that car after watching that video on their website asking for Derek to, to sell them the car. That's huge. Why? Because it made a connection. And it's funny. And he's entertaining. And he's got personality. And he's real. That is viral. That spreads. But it spreads to the right people. If he spreads that to 15 or 20 people that are the right people, that's going to make him a lot, mo lot more money than spreading it to a million people that will just watch it and laugh at it. He didn't focus on the features of the vehicle. He focused on the benefits. Your friends, your family will be so thrilled with you. Drop dead gorgeous. He didn't talk about the mechanism that actually lowers the roof or any of that kind of stuff. Sales 101. Never discuss features, always talk benefits. Sales 101. Forget the bells and whistles. It's irrelevant. It doesn't connect. All bells and whistles do is make noise. You're trying to cut through the noise. That's what successful marketing is about. That's what makes something viral. When you can cut through the clutter, cut through the noise, you're viral. You're successful. You've got a shot. You have five to eight seconds to make a connection. And it only takes a split second to get the wrong message. That video is friggin' 
awesome. <laughs> if I just need to laugh, I watch that. And I've seen it like a thousand times. <laughs> that is the best video everywhere, but it makes a point really quick, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's what we did with uh, Kiwi, and we're discussing now with uh, and launching with Kiwi Shoe Polish. We're going to do a, a podcast show with them to kind of get the message out about their, their express products. Uh, they have a line of express products you can keep in your glove box or your purse or what have you that are disposable, like everything else nowadays. Everybody's got the disposable product, and so is Kiwi. So they wanted to use podcasting. They thought that was a good venue. And, uh, but they're not going to create, or we're not going to create anyway, a podcast about how to shine your shoes. If you can't figure out how to take the stupid little sponge out of the thing and rub it on your shoe, you're not operating an iPod. So we had to figure out again, who is the customer for shoe polish? It's actually most people in this room. It's business people consume more of their stuff than anyone else. People that need to dress for success, look their best, get in front of a customer, and not have the guy staring at the smudge on your shoe while you're trying to pitch your product. So it's business people. So just like the Ronnie Coleman video, who do business people look up on the web, read, find out about, um, who do people consider mentors? Well, they're probably some of the best writers and authors in sales and marketing. Guys like Brian Tracy and Jack Canfield and Harry Beckwith, those guys. Uh, international bestsellers whose books have been translated into 50 languages. So we hired those guys and did little 20-minute podcast interviews with them on the topic of dressing for success or looking your best. Harry Beckwith, who's a friend of mine and wrote Selling the Invisible uh, is written four amazing books. Selling the Invisible is the classic. Uh, if you haven't read that, you need to read that. Uh, he also wrote the foreword to my book. He has a whole chapter on visible details in his book that is just amazing. That makes you think about not just what you say, but you, how you posture. And we call the show Polished, because it's about being polished. And it's brought to you by Kiwi. And at the end of the show, you'll be able to find a URL to go and get sample products. So it's, again, getting the right thing in front of the right person with the right message for something they want. This maybe plays a little more toward your question of how do you provide education and get something in return. So we're giving them access to the minds of some of the greatest sales and marketing minds out there for 20 minutes, and then in exchange for them to maybe go and check out this product. And then we're branding. We're going to hit them again and again and again. So there, there's, if you think it through, you can come up with some great ideas. And great ideas connect. Um, one of the questions inevitably everyone asked me and Kiwi asked me, they go, well, does anybody search for the word podcast? And I said, uh, no. You know, nobody looks for a podcast. Um, podcasts are content, though. It doesn't mean no one's listening to a podcast. Don't get me wrong. People are, lots of people. But they don't use the word podcast in their search. So I'm not looking for shoe polish podcast, dress for success podcast. Um, when I'm searching for things about dressing for success, I want this to show up in organic and there's websites created around it, so on and so forth, and I'll listen to it because it's another form of content. After saying that, I wanted to verify that no one did search for podcasts, so I started to see what people search for when they do use the word podcast in their search terminology. Uh, the number one thing, number one type of podcast people search for are religious podcasts. It's typed in somewhere close to 300 times a day, every day. Religious podcast, every denomination out there. Um, I couldn't find a picture of God on short notice. I think he's driving the truck. <laughs> Pretty sure. Health is the next thing. Close to 200 times a day, people are looking for health-related podcasts, every type of ailment out there. So these, if you're in these two businesses, podcasting is probably a good thing for you. Uh, and, and logically, and this, you probably know this already before I even go to the next bullet, once you have religion, once you have health, the next most popular thing you search for is Family Guy. <laughs> People are looking for Family Guy podcasts 25 times a day. Uh, no surprise there. And then, of course, once you have your Family Guy fix, podcast fix, you look for a knitting podcast <laughs> at 15 times a day. This one was like one of those, what? Uh, I started thinking about, if I'm acting like a customer or thinking like a customer, who knits? Uh, well, it's my grandmother is what I think of. And I'm like, I don't really think she's looking for podcasts, but 15 people a day are. So I typed it in, and you should too. Type in knitting podcasts into Google or any search engine. This is the website that showed up, nitty.com. Awesome, awesome website. You see, nitty.com rocks. You come up and get a book. 
All right, you get a book. I only have two, so you get one when you're done. Um, Knitty.com is a great website. Like, it didn't convince me to want to learn to knit. Um, but I did find out recently through Knitty.com that clicking ass, that term, what it means in the Urban Dictionary is knitting really fast and making that clicking noise with your knitting stick. <laughs> and I'm like, that clicks ass. So I also found out that on Knitty.com there is an online audio knitting revolution. I had no idea. It must be Knit One Pearl 2.0. No one told me. So, and then you can get your knitty swag. And I'm like, that's perfect. I'm going to get a shirt for my grandmother. Uh, unfortunately, I do not think my grandmother will wear a shirt that says Yarn Ho. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. If she would, we'd go shopping every freaking day. I'd be at the mall with my grandmother. Get your shirt, Grandma. We're going shopping. <laughs> and then after knitting, science 14 times a day. Uh, and those, that, there's your top five podcast search terms, in case you're wondering. So here's social rules before I kind of wrap this up, getting toward the end here. Only a few minutes left. Uh, social rules, which apply to everything. Websites, podcasts, viral video, social, everything. It's social is how we interact. Social is not new. It's cavemen socialized. We socialize. It's, they did it in cave painting. We do it on Twitter and Facebook but it's still social. These are the rules you already know. You're judged by the company you keep. It seems to me a lot of people are, think they're judged by the number of, and quantity of company they keep, how many people they have they're, they're connected to. Now, messages spread faster through like-minded people because they have networks that are like-minded as well. You want to increase your sphere of influence, no doubt, but you want to do it in a positive way, a way where things flow instead of dissipate. So look at who your friends are. You know, friend, when you do friend someone or follow someone, keep an eye on what they do, what they post up there. A lot of times it's just going to muddy the waters and clog things up and there's no value. Um, you know, when the, I will friend almost anyone that sends me a friend request, but I do watch. There needs to be value. Uh, not everyone that sends me a friend request. There was a couple of Pakistani strippers I said no right off the bat. Um, and probably some of you have them as friends, actually, because it's a numbers game. They it's, could be customers tomorrow. They could be, they could be customers tomorrow. Uh, what business are you in, sir? <laughs> Sorry. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Keeps going back to thinking like a customer. Most people that come to my company um, as customers hate the stuff they put in front of customers. They don't think about it. Car dealers especially have had for years, I've written about it, I've talked about it in interviews, the most worthless websites on the face of the planet. There's nothing there for a car buyer. I'm, I'm not a car guy. I don't work in that industry. I never have. Uh, we started, when we were hired by our first car dealer client, which happens to be um, Brad Benson, the former New York Giant, turned you know, Super Bowl winning New York Giant that turned uh, car dealer. Why I, they do that, I don't know. But... Um, our pitch to him was, we're not going to build you a car dealer website. We're going to build you a car buyer website. And we're going to focus on your customers and give us car buyers something we can use for a freaking change. Instead of, here's our inventory and every car is on special. Because that's what they have. So you want to put somebody in front of your messages that maybe doesn't even know you or what you do and see if they get it. Do they understand? Do they connect with it? Is it too much, too jargon heavy? And it's not our fault. We get tunnel vision. We're, we're saying these words. Speaking to speak every single day, but you have to take a step back and look at things with a fresh set of eyes Because again with that five to eight seconds you got to connect and you got to connect quick and videos are even less You have probably milliseconds to make a connection My favorite rule is if you keep doing that you're gonna go blind. It's not so much as a, a rule is more of a mantra uh, It's not actually blind. It's invisible. You become blind to your customers, but you become invisible if you keep doing the wrong things over and over again, your bad message becomes viral because people spread it. That whole rule about if you make a happy customer, they tell one to two people. If they're unhappy, it's 10 or 20 is gone. That's an old rule. Happy or unhappy, it's thousands of people and it lives forever. So you keep doing the wrong things, bad things happen. So you have to think about the value of the negative. You know, which kind of goes to this gentleman's point where he says, well, what do you do about the negative with a negative brand? The, saying no or, or giving someone the wrong message 
If that's a first impression of your brand, is they look at it and you attracted the wrong person, they're gonna have a negative in their head about you. That's the first impression they have. You have to think about who you're attracting and what you're putting in front of them. I'll give you a perfect example, simple, something everyone can understand about a failure to connect that is a, is a true story, not that anything else I'm saying isn't true, but this one is actually more personal. Um, my wife and I were redoing our family room and we wanted to rip up the old carpet and put down hardwood flooring. Now this particular room in my house is on a concrete slab and I'm a kind of handy guy so I know I'm very limited to what kind of hardwood I could put there and I really don't like laminate because it looks like laminate. So I have to do some research to find out the best hardwood flooring for the application that I had. So I go online, like we all do, I type in best hardwood flooring and this is the website that showed up, number one in Google, in organic uh, and paid, which I didn't get that either, but it was in both. And uh, the reason that this website showed up was not because it was a great website. It sucked pretty bad. They do, did keyword stuffing. Every second to third word was hardwood flooring. If you want hardwood flooring, we've got hardwood flooring, got hardwood flooring in the back, we've got some hardwood flooring on the front, we've got some hardwood flooring over here, there's hardwood flooring over here. You probably need hardwood flooring, you wouldn't be here looking for hardwood flooring. On and on and on and on. And it, I mean, it read like a three-year-old. No persuasion. They showed up, absolutely. But placement without persuasion doesn't turn into success. So placement isn't everything. You have to persuade. This persuaded me, but in a, in a, not in a positive way. Uh, then I looked to the left, because that is how someone's eyes typically track, is we do look left for navigation. And it was brand names. I didn't know what brand hardwood floor I needed. I need to know what I need. I need someone to educate me, not assume I knew what I was talking about, because I didn't. Then I looked to the right, and there's Google AdWords, which was awesome, because all his competitors were there, because he used the word hardwood floors so many times. <laughs> Stupid. If you're in business, like a, a service business, a product business, and you're actually going to sell something, don't put these ads on your website. You might make a couple of bucks, but this guy lost thousands of dollars in sales to his competitors because his website sucked. He goes, hey, this website sucks, but here's all my competitors. Go see them. <laughs> and I did, and I bought my floors from the guy. But the one interesting thing about this site is there was one sentence on this site that really just stuck in my head because it was the stupidest grouping of words I have ever read in one sentence in my entire life. And I've read a lot of stuff. So I'm going to share it with you, because this is, again, so you can leave here and say, I just read the stupidest sentence ever written on the face of the planet. Hardwood floor is a material that has fascinated humans for thousands of years. <laughs> really? Really? It's wood, right? I mean, it's wood. Hardwood floor is made out of wood. And, is it, and then I thought, is it only humans? And who uses the term humans? Who calls somebody human? Hi, human. But is it only humans that are fascinated by hardwood? Because I'll tell you what, when we put down the hardwood floor in the family room and my dog ran across it and tried to make a left, that dog was pretty friggin' fascinated. <laughs> the only good thing that came out of this website was I've added it to my presentation and thousands of people have seen it. <laughs>